Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome back from your two week spring break. I hope you guys enjoyed it despite all this craziness. Hope you guys are able to find some ways to keep yourself busy while we're all in quarantine. Um, so this week, uh, we will be continuing our, our lecture series on anatomy. Um, last week, or two, three weeks ago, rather, um, we discussed cellular anatomy, both plant and animal cells. This week, we will be covering plant anatomy, and then next week, we'll be covering human anatomy. Um, my hope in putting all of these, putting cell, plant, and uh, human anatomy together, um, I hope you guys see similarities between the different levels of anatomy and the organization similarity between them. Um, hopefully, it'll help you guys remember all of the different anatomical parts of cells, plants, and animals. Um, this week, we'll be covering chapter 20, and we will be going over the various kinds of plant tissue and uh, the anatomy of uh, the anatomy of a leaf, uh, trees, and flowers. Um, so, just like cells and animals, plants have parts that give it structure make food, transport nutrients and water, and reproduce. In the same way uh, human embryos start out as stem cells, plant embryos also start out as undifferentiated. Instead of stem cells, these undifferentiated plant cells are called meristem cells. Throughout the life of the plant, the meristem cells are allowing the tree to grow taller, roots to grow deeper, and the branches to grow wider. The meristem cells located at the top and the bottoms of the plant are called the apical meristem. And also, also like the stem cells, um, meristem cells give rise to cells with special functions, or also called differentiated cells. It differentiates into three kinds of tissue. Epidermal tissue, which is the outer protective covering, ground tissue, uh, which is the filler uh, tissue and carries out various functions. And then vascular tissue, um, which of course just helps in the transport of various, various nutrients and water throughout the plant. Here you can see the uh, stem cells of the plant cells, also called meristem cells. Um, they will start out as undifferentiated, meaning that they don't have any, uh, they can't perform any special functions. But as the plant matures and develops into an adult plant, those meristem cells will divide and give rise to cells that have specialized functions. Um, and that can be found in, the, in the, different, the three different tissue types that we just covered. Similarly to humans, the entire body of a plant cell is covered in epidermis. However, these are different types of epidermal cells that, um, than those found in human skin. There's a couple of different types of specialized epidermal cells that are found in the plant. If the epidermal cells are exposed to air, they are covered with a waxy cuticle that will prevent water loss and protects against bacteria. The epidermis of the leaves have small openings in them called stomata, and this allows for the intake of carbon dioxide for photosynthesis, and as well as the release of oxygen, which is, going, which is a byproduct of photosynthesis. Here you, can, here you can start to see um, the, the seedling of a cabbage um, start to grow a root, hair, a root right here. You can see these tiny hair-like projections that extend from the root. These hair-like projections help increase the surface area of the root so that the plant can absorb more water, allowing it to mature into an adult plant. The stomata on leaves acts in a similar way as the respiratory system does in humans. It allows for the exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen from the plant to the atmosphere. The, uh, the stoma have two guard cells around it, which allows it to close if the plant needs to, if the plant needs to conserve water in, in places like the desert or if it's just really hot outside. If the stomata were open all the time, then the plant would quickly dry out, as I'm sure you guys can imagine. Because carbon dioxide is needed for photosynthesis, stomata need to be open for a certain amount of time for the plant to get enough CO2. Uh, desert plants have a special way of regulating photosynthesis and opening the stomata. 
Um, these plants only open their stomata and perform photosynthesis at night to prevent water loss in the hot and dry desert. In the trunk of a tree, there are these cells called cork cells instead of epidermal cells. Cork cells are also created by meristem cells called cork cambium. These cork cells layer on top of each other to create the tick bark, or sorry, the thick bark of the tree trunk. The cell walls of the cork cells are covered in an epidermal material, sorry, in a lipid material called suberin. Suberin waterproofs the trunk and protects it from the chemicals and some bacteria. A ground tissue uh, forms the bulk of leaves, stems, and roots, and they contain three different types of cells, parenchyma cells, cholenchyma cells, and sclerenchyma cells. Parenchyma cells are the least specialized. Um, they, many, they may contain chloroplast and may carry on photosynthesis. And some may contain colorless plastids that help store products of photosynthesis, um, which we'll see today, or which we will observe in today's lab. Um, potato cells have something called amyoplasts that are colorless, but they help store the starch um, that, that can be made from the glucose molecule, molecules that are made during photosynthesis. And this gives uh, potatoes a food source when they can perform photosynthesis, um, like on very cloudy days or during the winter. Cholenchyma cells are like parenchyma cells, except they have irregular, irregularly shaped uh, corners and thicker walls. Cholenchyma cells often form bundles just beneath the epidermis and give flexible support to immature regions of the body. The strands in the cellular stalks are mainly composed of cholenchyma cells. Sclerenchyma cells have thick secondary walls containing lignin which make plant cell walls uh, tough and hard. Most, uh, most of these cells are non-living and the primary function is to support mature regions of the plant. The hard outer shells of the nuts are made of sclerenchyma. Strings of, of sclerenchyma is the reason cotton and flax fibers can be woven into cloth and hemp fibers can, be, uh, can make really strong rope. The vascular tissue of trees acts in the same way blood vessels do for humans. It transports nutrients to different parts of the plant. The vascular tissue is called the xylem and the phloem and can be found in the roots, trunk, branches, and stem of the leaves. The xylem uses two types of cells to move water and nutrients from the soil to the leaves, vessels, elements, and tracheids. The vessel elements form a pipeline that is larger than the tracheids and allow for a continual flow of nutrients and water. The tracheids also connect together to allow the water to flow through them. Notice the large tubes uh, right here. These tubes are called vessel elements. These are wide enough to allow substantial water and nutrients to flow to the leaves so that, the, um, so that there is enough uh, enough um, things to get photosynthesis going and so that the plant can uh, create more glucose for its energy needs. The tracheids, however, found in between the vessel elements, uh, you can see them right here, um, are smaller of course, but still allow for water to flow up to the leaves. After the sugars are made by the chloroplasts, these flow down the phloem to the other plant cells to be used for energy. The sugars flow through the sieve tube members, which are, uh, which are called so because there are pores, uh, sorry, become, which are called so because there are pores in their cell wall. Notice here the pores at the top and at the bottom of the sieve tube, sieve tube member. This is what gives these cells their name. The sieve tube members um, has only or only contains cytoplasm, but there are cells on the side here uh, called companion cells. These cells do contain a nucleus, unlike unlike the sieve tube members, 
and scientists aren't exactly sure, but um, they may be involved in transporting the sugars uh, to the various tissues in the plants. So now we'll move on to section two, which covers plant organs. A flowering plant, um, whether a cactus, a daisy, an apple tree, or an apple tree, has a shoot system and a root system. The shoot system consists of the stems, leaves, flowers, and fruit. A stem supports the leaves, transports material between the roots and leaves, and produces new tissue. The root system consists of the roots that are in the soil. At the tips of the roots and at the top of the plant are the apical meristems, um, which are those undifferentiated cells. And um, the apical meristem allows uh, for primary growth. And primary growth um, just means that the plant is simultaneously growing up and uh, further up into the atmosphere or growing taller, I guess, um, or growing further down into the soil so that it can find the nutrients and the water that it needs. Here is the anatomy of a young plant. The shoot system is um, the parts of the plant that are located above ground, and the shoot system is the parts of the plant that are located below ground. On the main stem here, uh, we have um, uh, both nodes, so located here and here, and then internodes. Nodes are where the leaves or the buds for new branches are attached to the stem. So we have one node here and one node here. And then the internode is just a space on the main stem located in between the nodes. Lateral buds, um, like this one right here, will give rise to new branches or leaves that extend to the side of the branches while the terminal bud up here um, contains apical meristem that will uh, produce new plant tissue during primary growth, allowing the plant to grow taller. The root tip, located down here, also contains apical meristem and will allow the roots to grow deeper, allowing the plant to be able to um, locate more nutrients and water so that it can grow more. Um, so here you, um, here you can see the roots, and then you can see these tiny little hair projections here called the root, ha uh, the root hairs um, that give the roots more surface area, allowing it to consume more water and nutrients um, so that it can grow more. Here you can see the terminal bud under 100 times magnification. You can see the apical meristem that contains the undifferentiated meristem cells. From this new plant tissue, like immature leaves, um, will, uh, will arise. You can also see that the lateral bud just beneath the terminal bud, um, from the lateral bud, uh, new branches or leaves will sprout, just depending on the type of plant that it is. Flowering plants can be divided into two types of groups, monocots and eudicots. Whether a plant is one or the other just depends on the amount of cotyledons that are present inside the seeds. And cotyledons are the first embryonic uh, leaves present in the seeds. Um, but, they, but usually cotyledons will disappear once the first true leaves of the plants appear. The one cotyledon in monocots acts to store some nutrients for the seedling and also transport more nutrients to the seedling um, that is located uh, elsewhere. Monocots include grasses, lilies, orchids, palm trees, rice, wheat, and corn. Two cotyledons in eudicot supply all the nutrients for the seeding, uh, seedlings, and eudicots include dandelions, oak trees, and uh, some others. Cotyledons aren't easy to see, so thankfully there are uh, differences between monocots and eudicots uh, that will allow us to distinguish whether a plant is one or the other. In the root pitchers, the xylem are going to be the red dots and the phloem are going to be the blue dots. In the monocot root, the vascular tissue occurs in a ring around the center. And then in the eudicot root, um, the, the vascular tissue is located in the center the xylem, is going to, uh, the xylem is going to form a star, 
well, the phloem is going to be located just in the pits of that star. Um, the, within the stems of the eudicot, the xylem and the phloem are, are paired together in vascular bundles. The vascular bundles are going to be scattered um, in the monocot stem, while in the eudicot stem, those vascular bundles are going to be um, just on the outside of the stem, as you can see here. Within the leaves, the vascular bum bundles form veins. Uh, within the monocots, uh, the veins are parallel, while in the eudicots, the veins form a net-like pattern. The flowering parts of these plants also form a certain pattern. The monocots have flowers, uh, flower parts in threes or multiples of threes, and eudicots have flower parts in fours, fives, or multiples of fours and fives. Next, we'll move on to section three, which contains or, um, which covers the organization of leaves, stems, and roots. Leaves are going to be the primary organ of photosynthesis since they're really broad and allows for the maximum surface area for the collection of solar energy and the absorption of CO2. The other thing needed for photosynthesis is water, and the plant will receive this from the root system in addition to other needed, um, other needed elements like potassium that the plant will use for other biological molecules. Um, some, uh, some plants will lose their leaves throughout the year, like deciduous trees. So we have a lot of deciduous trees in Indiana. And some, um, some trees or plants will keep their leaves all year round, like evergreen trees. Um, some examples of evergreen trees is uh, like pine trees or fir trees. Um, the anatomy of the leaf includes the blade, which is going to be the wide portion of the leaf. Um, the blade may be simple or compound. And then at the base of the leaf is going to be the petiole, which is the stalk that attaches the blade to the main stem of the plant. So the leaf on the left is a simple leaf. And then the leaf on the right and on the bottom picture are called compound leaves. The small leaves of a compound leaf, so these tiny things right here, um, or these right here, are called leaflets. So here we have the leaflets, but then this entire thing here is going to be the leaf, and then this entire thing here is going to be the leaf. This is a simple compound leaf, and this here is called a double compound leaf. The petiole, uh, log um, the petiole connects the leaf to the main stem. Um, and then the lateral bud, seen here, um, will, will tell you whether a leaf is simple or compound because the lateral bud will be located at the bud of the leaf and they will not be located at the base of the leaflets. So think of a standard tree leaf. The outside of the leaf feels very waxy, right? This is called the cuticle. It prevents the leaf from drying out and losing valuable gases. Uh, just under the cuticle is the epidermis. Uh, within parts of the epidermis is the stomata, uh, which are those tiny holes that I had mentioned earlier. And, this, and these are used for gas exchange. The interior of the leaf is where photosynthesis takes place and is gonna be called the mesophyll. The mesophyll has two distinct regions called the palisade and the spongy mesophyll. The palisade mesophyll has tightly packed elongated cells that allows for the most absorption of sunlight, while the spongy mesophyll has irregularly spaced cells around are surrounded by air spaces. The loosely packed cells increases the amount of carbon dioxide the plant can take in and the amount of oxygen and water it can get rid of. Here you have a cross section of a eudicot leaf. On the top and bottom parts of the leaves are right here. And right here you have the waxy cuticles. And um, you can see here and here you have that epidermal layer. Um, the cuticle on the bottom of the leaf has the stomata, which allows for the gas exchange for the plant. Notice that the spongy mesophyll um, is right next to the stomata uh, for maximum gas exchange. Leaves have other purposes besides just photosynthesis. Um, it, can, it allows 
Um, it allows certain plants to, uh, to attach it to something else to allow it to support it, as seen by this tendril here of the cucumber plant. Um, uh, it allows the leaves on a Venus flytrap uh, helps capture the insects. And then the leaves or thorns um, on cacti serves as protection against, um, against uh, the, the cactus drying out and also protects it from, uh, uh, from different predators that may eat it. The stems of roses and the trunks of a maple tree are both considered stems. Stems have two main functions. They contain vascular bundles uh, where xylem and phloem are found and transports materials between roots and leaves. There are two types of stems. There are non-woody and then woody stems. Non-woody stems are called herbaceous plants uh, and only experience primary growth. Uh, woody stems, which includes trees and shrubs, experience both primary and secondary growth. Um, so primary growth um, is when trees either grow taller or grow deeper into the soil, while secondary growth is when trees um, grow um, out uh, grow out, grow sideways. Uh, stems can also serve as a place where water is stored and where photosynthesis takes place, as in, the, as in the case of a cactus. A potato is actually an underground stem uh, that stores food for the potato plants, as we'll see in lab later today. Um, it stores plants in little plastids called amyoplasts. And an underground stem is also called a tuber. Non-woody plants are also called herbaceous plants. Just like in leaves, the outermost layer is epidermal cells covered by a waxy cuticle. In eudicots, the stems have a cortex, a narrow band of parenchyma cells, and a pith in the center. And this pith um, just contains ground tissue. Monocots do not have either of these. Non-woody stems contain vascular tissue that supports its growth. The vascular tissue contains the phloem, xylem, uh, the phloem, xylem made of those vessel members in the tracheids, and then sclerenchyma cells for support. The vascular tissue in eudicots and monocots are arranged differently, um, as we have already talked about. In eudicots, the vascular bundles are, sur are surround the pith and is going to be and is surrounded by the cortex. In monocots, the vascular bundles are going to be dispersed throughout the stem. Here you can see cross sections of both the monocot and the eudicot stem. On the left hand side, you can see the eudicot stem. And on the right hand side, you can see the monocot stem. Um, in the center of the eudicot stem, you have the pith, which is just, uh, which is just gonna be made of that ground tissue. Um, surrounding the pith is gonna be those vascular bundles, uh, which contains the xylem and the phloem. Surrounding the vascular bundles is going to be the cortex uh, which is made of those parenchyma cells. And then surrounding the cortex is going to be that layer of epidermis um, that is then uh, layered with that waxy cuticle. Um, and the monocot stem, um, the monocot stem, or sorry, surrounding the monocot stem is also a layer of epidermis uh, with, a, uh, with a layer of waxy cuticle on the outside. But on the inside is just a large general area of ground tissue with vascular bundles, uh, with vascular bundles containing the xylem and the phloem that will be randomly placed throughout it. Woody stems include trees and shrubs. As the name suggests, the stem is going to be much thicker and stronger than those found on the non-woody plants. Unlike non-woody plants, woody plants experience both primary and secondary growth. Again, primary growth is just when the trees uh, grow both uh, taller and then deeper into the soil. And then uh, secondary growth is when the branches or the plant um, grow uh, more outwards. Woody plants are, uh, sorry, woody plants are able to grow wider as they age because of the location of the vascular cambium um, as it forms rings on the outside of the tree. Uh, you have all heard of growth rings on the inside, of the inside of the tree. Well, it is created by this vascular cambium. The vascular cambium produces new xylem and phloem tissues each year, producing those annual rings. A mature woody plant has three distinct parts, 
bark, wood, and then the pith. Uh, the bark includes the cork, the cork cambium, uh, the cortex, and then the phloem. The cork cambium makes the bark thicker every year as it produces more cork. And then the vascular cambium is located uh, between the bark and the wood. Uh, the vascular cambium produces more phloem, located closer to the outside of the tree, and xylem, located closer to the inside of the tree. In one year, the vascular cambium will create two sections of the xylem, summer and spring wood. The spring wood will be wider than the summer wood because there is going to be more rain in the spring. More rain means more photosynthesis, which just means more growth. Um, the spring wood and the summer wood make up the annual growth rings of a tree. And then in the center of the tree, you uh, have the pith. Uh, within the bark, as the tree ages, the cork cambium disrupts the epidermis and replaces it with cork cells. The cork cells are filled with subrin, which is a waxy layer that waterproofs the cell, but also uh, causes it to die. The roots of a plant have multiple functions, some we've already discussed, including anchoring the plant to the soil and absorbing water and minerals for the plant. Uh, the water and minerals it absorbs will flow through the xylem to the leaves. Uh, roots, uh, roots are circular and slimy so that they can grow, um, easily grow further down into the soil looking for water and mineral so uh, sources. The size of the roots is going to be dependent on both the size of the plant and the environment the tree is found in. Larger plants will, of course, have longer and thicker roots. And plants in dry environments will have longer roots because water isn't going to be as common. At the tips of the roots are going to be those root hairs, um, which just allows the plant to absorb even more water. Uh, root hairs are constantly being replaced. Um, a, rye a rye plant, for example, has about 14 billion root hairs and replaces about 100 million of them in a single day. As stems and leaves are diverse, so are roots. There are, um, there are three kinds of roots, tap roots, fibrous roots, and prop roots. Carrots have a tap root, which is going to be one main root, um, which stores the products of photosynthesis. Um, grass, uh, grass has fibrous roots, which are many slender roots um, that don't have a main root. And then corn has prop roots, um, which grow from the stem and provide additional support uh, um, so that the plant can grow tall and doesn't fall over. The apical meristem, which is located at the tip of the root, um, is protected by a root cap. The root cap is tough and slimy, so it can easily move through the soil and protect the dividing cells. Both monocot and uticot uh, roots have the same zones. So the root cap contains a zone of cell division. Next is the zone of elongation, um, which is where the cells differentiate into different kinds of cells and they'll lengthen in size. Uh, next is the zone of maturation, uh, which contains fully differentiated cells. The epidermal cells located on the outside of the root now has root hairs. Here you can see the apical meristem creating new cells. Um, the root cap um, protects the new cells from any soil and stones, and then as the cell matures, uh, they lengthen and then they start to specialize um, into the cells of the xylem, the phloem, the epidermis, uh, the root hairs. And then further up, you can see um, uh, further up the stem, you have the zone of maturation, which contains the fully differentiated cells. So now you can find all layers of the cells. And then the, and you can also find the root hairs located on the epidermis. Excuse me. Monocots have the same zones um, on the root as the uticot root. However, as discussed earlier, the vascular tissue is going to be organized differently. The uticot's root xylem is in a star shaped, uh, while the phloem is going to be located in the pits of the star. And then in a monocot, the xylem and the phloem surround the pith in the center of the root. Here you have the monocot root. Um, the, both the phloem and the xylem are going to be lo um, located around the center of the stem, as located here. And it is uh, called the vascular cylinder. 
There are five different types of root tissue. The outermost uh, layer is called is, uh, the epidermal cells with the root hairs. Under the epidermis is the cortex, which are going to be parenchyma cells that contain starch and so um, uh, may function in food storage. Uh, next comes the endodermis, which are rectangular cells pushed close up together. Um, two of the sides are going to be impermeable, and the other two sides allow water to pass um, through them as it goes to the vascular tissue. In this way, the, uh, the endodermis cells regulates the minerals that enters the vascular tissue. Next is the pericycle, which have cells that can divide and so produce new lateral roots. On the inside, you have the vascular tissue, which contains the xylem and the phloem. Next, we'll move on to ch uh, chapter 21, section 3, where we will cover the sexual reproduction in flowering plants. Uh, just like within animals, uh, plants also go through um, a two-stage life cycle. Um, they have the adult plants, which are going to contain those diploid cells, characterized by um, that 2N. Um, and then the adult plants are going to uh, produce gametes, which are going to be those haploid cells, characterized by that lowercase n. Um, the adult plant is also called a sporophyte, and the sporophyte is going to produce um, kind of like a pregummy, um, also called spores. Um, the spores are going to develop into gametophytes. Then uh, gametophytes are going to produce uh, the gametes that are actually going to um, the male and the female gamete that are under, going to undergo fertilization. And then, of course, um, upon fertilization, uh, when the egg and the pollen grain come together, you're going to return to that diploid, um, the diploid stage of the plant life cycle. In flowering plants, uh, the sporophyte or the adult form of the plant is going to be dominant and it is the generation that produces the flowers. Um, the flower of the adult plant um, or the sporophyte produces two types of spores, microspores and megaspores. And these are just fancy scientific terms to describe both the male, uh, the male gamete, um, which is going to be the pollen grain, and then um, the megaspore is going to be the female gamete, uh, which is the embryo sac. At maturity, a pollen grain uh, contains two non-flagellated sperm, and then at maturity, the embryo sac contains an egg. Um, in order to get to the embryo sac, because the embryo sac is stationary and is located at the base of the flower, the pollen grain is gonna have to find some way to get there, and that's what fertilization, or sorry, that's what um, pollination is for. Um, bees, birds, bats are going to come and pick up the pollen grain um, and then uh, spread it to um, the similar species of flowers um, so that pollen can fertilize the embryo sac. Uh, wind can also be used to disperse the pollen grains to, um, to, the, to the eggs so that fertilization can take place. Um, once the pollen grain gets to the flower, um, it develops a pollen tube and then the sperm move down the pollen tube to the embryo sac. Um, after the sperm fertilizes the egg, the zygote then be, uh, becomes an embryo, um, still located within the flower. Um, the embryo is going to eventually develop into the seed. And so, um, and then uh, once the seeds uh, is fully produced, um, it also contain, uh, besides the embryo, it will contain store food and a thick covering to prevent the embryo and the food from drying out. So pretty much the seed is going to contain everything that the plant will need to sprout once it's in favorable conditions, like really mo uh, moist soil. Um, once the seed finds a really, most, uh, really moist, nutrient-rich soil, um, a new plant will emerge and, and um, uh, develop. The life cycle of plants is well adapted to that of an, uh, existence on land, um, just because it prevents all um, things like the waxy cuticle on the outside of the leaf, or that thick covering on the outside of the seed, um, will prevent the uh, will prevent the adult plant or the embryo from drying out, allowing it to exist on land. Here you can see the two-stage life cycle of the plant, uh, very similar to humans. Um, mitosis is going to be is going to be the main form of cellular division um, as the plant develops from a zygote into the adult form, and then once the adult uh, reaches sexual maturity, 
um, then it will be able to undergo the cellular division of meiosis to produce both the male and the female gametes. Um, the male and the female gametes of the plant are also able to undergo meiosis um, to produce more of them. Um, once and then, uh, and, um, however, they still need to reach each other. So um, the the male gametes, the pollen, are going to be taken by pollinators or by wind to get to the egg in order to fertilize, uh, in order to fertilize the egg to create that seed. Um, and then once um, this, uh, once the seed reaches favorable conditions, uh, like the most, the moist and nutrient-rich soil, then it will undergo mitosis again to develop into an adult. Flowers are unique reproductive structures found only in angiosperms. And angiosperms is just a group of plants that contain flowers. Flowers are going to contain uh, both male and uh, female reproductive parts that produce both male and female gametes. The flowers are also really important in attracting pollinators that will aid in pollination. And um, <clears throat> once, uh, uh, once pollination and fertilization actually takes place, the flowers will produce some type of fruit that will help the seeds um, move to new land uh, where, um, they can, uh, where they can be uh, planted and germinate, um, allowing the species to, uh, further, um, to further spread in whatever habitat. <laughs> That's my dog. Um, to further spread in what habitat they're found in. Um, the typical flower has four whorls of different modified leaves that are attached to uh, uh, the receptacle. The sepals um, protect the bud as the flower develops. Petals uh, attract the pollinators. Um, there's gonna be uh, different kinds of, different colored flowers are gonna attract um, different kinds of pollinators. Uh, generally wind blown, uh, generally flowers that rely on uh, wind pollination uh, have no petals at all. Stamens are gonna be the male portion of the flower. This includes the anther and the filament. And then pollen, uh, the pollen is going to be located on the very tip of the anthers. The carpal is the female portion of the flower. This includes the, stem, the stigma, which is an enlarged uh, sticky type knob. It will be attached to the style, uh, which is a slender stalk. And then the style will be attached to the ovary, which of course just contains the eggs. Here, um, here you can see um, the anatomy of a flower. Uh, here we have the receptacle where all of our modified leaves are going to be located. Here you have the sepal located at the base of the flower. Here you have the ovule where your egg is located. Um, and the ovule is located within the ovary. The ovary then is attached to the style here, just a long tube, um, then, uh, which then uh, is attached to the stigma up here. The stigma is going to be sticky. Um, it's going to be sticky because it, um, it's going to try, it wants to try to uh, catch any pollen that comes near it. Uh, once the pollen uh, is attached to the stigma, it will then flow down the style so that it can get to the egg located in the ovary. Um, the stigma, the style, and the ovary together are called the carpal. Um, the male part of the plant, uh, which includes the anther and the filament, are located here. Um, notice how there's going to be multiple male parts um, in the flower, while generally there's just going to be one female part. And then of course you have the, the big petals here. And the big petals, uh, the main purpose of the petals is to attract various kinds of pollinators. Um, different flowers will have different kind, different colored uh, petals um, because it attracts a certain, it is meant to attract a certain kind of pollinator. Um, uh, for example, a bee pollinated flower is typically a color other than red um, because bees can't see red. Butterfly pollinated flowers are wide, allowing uh, the butterfly to land. Hummingbird flowers are typically curved back, um, which, is, uh, which generally allows the bird's beak to reach the nectar. Um, and then bat pollinated flowers are large and sturdy since bats are really big and could easily break the plant. So those those flowers need to be large and sturdy, um, able, able to withstand rough treatment. 
bat pollinated flowers are also generally white since bats are nocturnal and white is going to be a color that is easier seen at nighttime. Next, we'll move on to section four of chapter 21, which covers asexual reproduction and genetic engineering in plants. Plants, just like some cells in animals, uh, can reproduce asexually. Um, if you wanted to plant a bed of tulips, irises, or gladiolas in your garden, you wouldn't want to plant seeds, but instead you would rely on bulbs, rhizomes, or corms and grow the plants asexually. Other plants, like the strawberry plant, uh, can grow from nodes on a stolon, um, which are horizontal stems. Seedless fruits can uh, be produced in a, a variety of ways, um, but generally require some type of stimulus. In agricultural, uh, seedless fruits are desirable for plants that have hard seeds, like bananas and pineapples. New plants can grow from the original plant by using these four different kinds of modified stems. The strawberry plant over here um, has above ground horizontal stems called stolons um, that connect the different nodes to each other. And the nodes are um, the root systems. Um, every other node is able to produce a new kind of, uh, is able to produce a new strawberry plant. Um, here you have an iris rhizome and the, uh, the rhizomes are gonna also be able to produce new plants. Here you have uh, potato tubers these little things right here that are able to produce new potatoes. And then here you have a gladiola corm that are able that are going to be able to produce new gladiola, uh, gladiolas. Um, I hope you enjoyed this lecture. And of course, as always, email me if you have any questions.